Bruchim Aboim. Um, it's interesting, I haven't given a class, I think, for over a month. Seems like I've gone through a month of laryngitis, cold, flu. I wasn't even sure if it was pneumonia. Um, I really was out of commission with a fever for over a week. And it really gave me time to think and to uh, ask why. And what I realized was life is about experience. And whether we ask for it or not, God gives us experience for us to learn. You know, I teach a lot, but besides teaching, I really spend a great deal of my time counseling people, dealing with people and trying to help them with their lives. Teaching comes from knowledge. But many times, it's really only theory. If you mix knowledge with experience, then I believe what you have is something that people will listen to because what you're talking about is truth. You're relating to people. So what gives me the experience then to teach? So I was thinking about it while I was home. So going all the way back, my mother was a survivor. At the age of 13, she left a concentration camp. A rich girl with seven siblings who walked out with no family at all, no mother, no father, no brothers, no sisters. She married my father when she was 13, had me at age 14. I uh, remember her, her telling me that she used to keep me on the ground because she was afraid she'd break me. She really didn't do nothing and there was really no one to teach her. She had three kids by the time she was 18. Let's see, so I was sexually abused by my father at four and a half. My father tried to kill me when I was five. He spent most of his life in institutions. My parents were divorced in the 50s. In the 50s, nobody was divorced. And I remember people would ask me, where was my father? It would have been, I always wanted to say he was dead. It would have been easier to say. It's telling someone that you have a father who's in an institution and your parents are divorced. Walked around with a bit of embarrassment. Let's see, I was a bedwetter. I was fat. I stuttered terribly bullied, wore glasses, horn-rimmed. Today they're cool. They were not cool in the 50s. I grew up on welfare. Um, it's funny, I had a pickup. We would go to school, to a religious school, and I had to pick up free books and things that we got from my siblings. First job I had was at 10. I remember working in a grocery where we had a, an account you don't see it today, where the guy would write down when my mother would get the welfare check, she'd pay it and we ran a bill. My first decent clothes, I went to the house of a young man. Family had lost a son who was 13 years old. First time I had a decent suit, nice pair of shoes. And I was religious until the age of 15. And at age 15, Again, hand to God, someone told me something about I was on my way to hell anyways. So I decided if I wasn't going to get the next world, I might as well take this world, so I left. And I got a job at 15 working in a deli, which uh, I managed to own 10 years later. And uh, I guess I became what's called the American dream, rags to riches. I've kind of only known poverty or riches. Um, I used to work. I didn't start public school till the 11th grade. I would, would get up 5.30 every morning and go to work. Then I'd go to school, and then I'd come home after school and go back to work. And uh, it's interesting, I wanted to go to law school, and I took three years of college. And uh, they wanted me to take a major. <laughs> and I kept saying, I just want to be a lawyer. They said, no, you got to take a major. So anyway, so my junior year, you had to declare a major. So I just wrote down sophomore and went back, got my classes. And I went to go see a advisor. And this was 19, late 1967. And um, I told him I was kind of floundering around trying to find my way. He said, what do you like to do? I said, well, I like playing my guitar. I like writing poetry. And I like working in a deli. 
So he tells me out of the three choices to go work in a deli, and I, like an idiot, thought it was a great idea. <laughs> Problem was, I didn't know they were going to stop the draft, so I called up the draft board and dropped out of school. And they said, don't worry about it, we already got your number. So they drafted me in the U.S. Army from 68 to 70. And out of a company of 150 young men, 125 went to Vietnam. I wasn't one of them. God's always looked out for me. But the trepidation was there. I knew what it was like, everybody wondering, you know, whether you'd have to go through that and what it would be like. It's funny, I met my wife in the Army, and uh, we wound up getting married. The war keeps going on. <laughs> and uh, I came back to the deli that I had left and became a manager, and then um, I became the part the, my... Uh, boss made me a manager, quote, partner. He put me on a five-year deal in the first year of the, of the agreement. He got cancer, and I watched my uh, mentor die of cancer at the age of 41. Stupid as we are when we're younger. I was 25. I remember thinking at least he had lived a life. When I hit 41, I realized what a baby I was at 41. And again, as we live through life, that experience of realizing just how much we've learned as we grow. I uh, took care of his wife and three children for 10 years. And then I turned the one deli that I had, actually I didn't even want. I remember telling him that, uh, he was telling me what happened when he died. And I told him when he died, I was leaving. And he told me, pardon the expression, but he said, schmuck, you're doing me a favor, I'm not doing you a favor. And uh, so I stuck around and took care of his family. Took, turned the, the three delis, the one deli into four, closed one just to learn humility. And uh, this, this delis had become an institution in Detroit. Married my wife, who's been 46 years, and she gets all the credit, because she's a saint, not me. I went through it all. I went through drugs, gambling, women, yachts, cars, you name it. There aren't many potholes in life that I haven't stepped in. I always say that a smart person learns from his mistakes, a brilliant person from someone else's. What I try to do is tell people which potholes not to step into, because I probably have. It took us three years for my wife and I to have our daughter and six more before my son was born. It's interesting that we had put in for adoption. And um, when we put in for adoption and they called, is when my wife got pregnant. And I guess that happens, seems like more so than that. But And it's interesting that with my daughter, I really didn't become religious. I knew about God and I had made my reckoning it was the kind of Faust. I sold my soul to the devil, and uh, life was a party. It was a challenge. I'm a game player. Although since I got religious, I don't play games at all. But then I did. That's all I did. Uh, everything was a game, and it was a challenge. And it was a comp competition between me and anybody else that wanted to compete. And that's what life basically was. So when my daughter was born, I didn't want to be religious. Didn't want to be a bad person. It wasn't going to hurt anybody, but I knew there was a God in the world. But religion just seemed, I, I turned every rock in the garden over, just trying to find something else. And with my daughter, I figured I didn't change. So she get married and she'll marry a guy and he won't be all he should be. And she'll say, well, neither was my dad. And uh, I figured she'd deal with it better and deal with life better. I'd seen a lot of families, people got divorced for and indiscretion, whatever, and leaving kids without a father. And uh, I already grew up without one, so I figured I'd make her stronger and better. That was my rationalization. But then after six years, again, when my son was born, I remember with my daughter, I was out in the waiting room. Really awful being out in the waiting room, waiting to find out what's going to happen through a pregnancy and whether everything's going to be okay until you finally hear that everything is. But you think of every scenario that could be a negative while it's going on. 
So as much as I, being a doctor was never a question for me. Um, and anyway, so I, my son, with my son, I was in the delivery room. And I was sure it would be another girl. And when he was born, that changed my whole life. I walked out of a delivery room, and I became a balchuva. I became a repentant. One, because I thought he would grow up to be me, which of course he didn't. And I found out that God tricks us all by giving us children so that we think we're doing something with them, when in reality the only person that you're bringing up is yourself. He is who he is, and I am who I am. And God bless him, but we're not the same person. But I did want to thank God, because he gave me something that was very precious. And uh, his bar mitzvah was my bar mitzvah. And I know exactly how long I've been religious, because I know exactly how old he is. And I know the exact moment that it happened. And so I've tasted life. I've been rich. I've been poor. I've been happy. I've been sad. I've been embarrassed. I've been honored. I've been arrogant. And I've been humbled. I've been a taker. Most of the time a giver. And I've made a lot of mistakes. Good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from bad judgment. Looking back on my life, I see God very clearly. I could not have made it without him watching out for me. So in hindsight, God's very clear. So again, what does this have to do with me being sick? And the answer is, as much as I tell people, I want to wish you were foolish and I want you to feel better, do I really mean it? Is it from the core? And the truth of the matter is, you really want to tell them, walk it off. <laughs> you know, just, it'll happen. And, and it doesn't work that way. There are times when you just can't do anything about it, that you're just dragged down with it. And you just hope and pray that that cloud in front of your eyes leaves. And when you see a person, you need to know that. You need to be truly compassionate. You need to understand how they feel. From Nachon or Chernobyl used to save people who were in prison. And one day he found himself in prison, and one of his students came to him, and he didn't know why he was there. And the student said to him, Rebbe, it might be you're here because when you take people out of prison, maybe you're not doing it quick enough. Maybe you don't realize how awful it is to be in jail. And he said, thank you. That's, I'm sure, what God wants to teach me. And later on that night, he pushed on the door of the cell that was open. He walked out, and that was it. You don't know what it is until you experience it. As in Pirkei Avos, Hill says, don't judge someone until you've been in his situation. You know, when you're sick, the truth of the matter is, especially today, text someone, call someone. Not everybody wants you to visit. They've got to put themselves together. It's difficult, especially a woman. Doesn't let you want to be seen and in, in in, without looking proper. And even if you visit someone in the hospital, try to go in the afternoon. Because a lot of times people feel better in the morning. And if you see them and they don't look like they're feeling well, you pray for them. And you need to pray for them. Because that's what it's about. Feeling their pain. Being with them. Being compassionate. Letting them know that you really care. You know, life experiences make you stronger. Harder, better, more compassionate. The higher the temperature on steel, the stronger that steel is. So instead of seeing things in a negative, understand that everything that may be bitter in life will make you better. Thank God for every experience you have, even those that are difficult. Even a childhood that you may not volunteer to, to go back and do. But it's interesting, if someone would come to me and say at age 15, and give me another chance about whether I leave yeshiva or whether I stay. I would stay, and I wouldn't be half the person I am today. Because by going through everything that I went through, it helped me to understand and to not just sympathize with people because I've read something or I heard something, but because I felt it, because I've lived it, because I've been there. So when someone cries out, I, I, I can feel the pain. I can cry with them. And when someone cries with you, it feels better. Somehow it helps. And God should bless us all that we don't have to go through too much bitterness. But at the same time, understand everything that you experience in life is there for a purpose. There are no accidents. 
and always see the bright side of what it's about and use every experience you have that if somehow me being abused as a child, there was a person in our synagogue who all of a sudden realizes as a 50-year-old woman that she was abused and she could talk to me because she understood that I knew. And going to a rabbi is theory. Is theory. Coming to someone who got through it helped her to make her journey better. And that's the key. Everything that's happened to you is there for a purpose. And know that there is a God who's watching over all of us. May God bless you all with only good and only see the goodness in life. God bless and have good experiences. Thank you for coming. Have a good Shabbos.